magnified here. This is your stage. And we ask that by your spirit, you will show yourself strong. You will show yourself strong. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Okay, please be seated. You will join me in 10 minutes. No, sit, sit, sit. Okay, you now have some tears. Don't you? Okay, so you join me in 10 minutes. I should be done in about 35, 40 minutes. And then um, maybe if we're other than that, if he interjects me. All right. Um, if you have been, if you have been sensitive to the utterances that God servant has been bringing forth to situate us accurately in tonight's session, we understand that um, the coming of the Spirit tonight is in the similitude of a woman who is pregnant. And who is desperately in need of delivering what she has embodied. Our assignment is very simple. It's just to label as accurate midwives. So that what the Holy Spirit wants to birth in our midst can be birthed. Now my assignment is to just join in the word as a midwife. And then um, we arrive on time. Once... His hand becomes a lot stronger. I would stop what I'm doing. All right. First Chronicles chapter 30, chapter 12, verse 32 is where I want to start from. If you have been a student of scriptures, one of the things you'll have found out is that God, using a multi- layered ex set of expressions has sufficiently introduced himself to his people. It's as though God has an obsession not to deal outside a knowing. So that, um, 10 minutes, two. are you counting? Yes. So that um, even though the Bible captures the communications of promises, of prophecies, of, um, of the acts of God, the Bible was not complete until we were sufficiently visited with the knowing of God, the revelations of God. As a student of scriptures, one of my feedbacks in the quest to know why God did not see his promises and his acts as a sufficient mode of communication. Why did he need to go that far in telling us who he is? It's because the revelations of God were designed to bring to us something beyond the knowing of his person. They were also to bring to us, um, how do I put it now? God's emphasis in seasons. So that in case you claim to have a very robust fellowship with God and you document, you will find out that your diary will have promises from God. Your diary will have instructions from God. You will have testimonies of the acts of God but your diary will also contain the names of God. And the names will be communicated as the gate opener of seasons in your life. So if you've not paid attention, it's a good time to pay attention. Because that's how it works. So, in a season of health, if God begins to emphasize himself as the God that heals, it gives you a picture of the movements, not just of your own, but of the enemy in the season that is to come. He not, he not always introduces himself as a promise keeper until he senses that there is a season in which you will begin to doubt him. So he gives a name in advance so that you can be locked into position. That's what I'm saying. For example, 
Um, I don't know what you think God is in this season in Nigeria. Many of our fathers believe that this is a season of judgment. The Lord wants to recover the nation and he will by judgment, but he needs to begin in the church. Is somebody with me? But you see, there may be nothing worth judging in your life. And so there will be the need to press beyond the congregational knowing as a God of judgment to find out what is God's emphasis to you. Because if God comes into this place as a judge, he can also provide. The nearness of God in one dimension is also the nearness of God in another dimension. We all just need to be attentive to how he chooses to introduce himself. It is to the end that we can deal accurately with him. I just have two portions of scripture. This is the first. In 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 1 Chronicles 12, 32, we see a king whose assignment is to put together a very robust army. And David understanding that the realities of God as captured within the reality of Israel was divided into the 12 tribes. What he did in mustering together his army was to pick men from all of the tribes. In that way, his army will advertise the different realities of God that were embodied in all of the tribes. You will not understand fully what I'm saying until you take a journey back to Genesis chapter 49. And you will find out that Jacob, as a prophet, gathered his sons together and began to speak unto them, not trying to create a future, but um, looping into the future and bringing into their lives what their days will look like. In that layout, you will see the uniqueness of every tribe, including the one that was designed to have few men and to waste. It was as though none of the sons had the ability to do anything about what their father said. He had to take a man of stature like Moses to keep Reuben in existence. Is somebody with me? Now, this is where I'm going. What he said to his sons became not just the reality of individual men, they became the reality of clans and of nations because Israel was like a 12 nation nation. Each of them advertising the uniqueness of the feedback of the blessing of their father. So you saw tribes that had mastered in heavy equipment fighting, tribes who had mastered in shooting arrows, tribes who had mastered um, close combat, that's with knives and with swords. You saw all kinds of men, but the 32nd verse advertised a very strange tribe who was not given to combat warfare, their capacity was in intelligence. If I had like two days, I'll have gone to track how they became intelligent. Because the conception of Issachar was based on the knowledge of timing. Okay, I'll tell you from scriptures. A night came when it was the turn of Rachel to sleep with her husband. And as she sat waiting for the husband to come for the field. The sons of Leah came back with mandrakes in their hands. And Rachel, needing the mandrakes, decided to appeal to the sons of Leah to give of what they had. And when Leah saw that an exchange was about to happen, she screamed and said, Oh, you wrestle with me over my husband. Now you want to take what belongs to my children. Okay. Rachel said, it's not a problem. I desperately need this mandrix. Now, remember she had been waiting on God all this while. If Rachel had known what was about to happen that night, there would have been no exchange. Okay, give me of your son's mandrix but sleep with my husband this night. And that night, Issachar was conceived. So, foundationally, Issachar was battered because of the consciousness of timings in the spirit. Somehow, Leah knew that a son was going to be given. And she knew what to exchange for the opportunity to give back to another son. So that tribe was battered in timing and their reality was accurate timing. 
David knew. And so, the Bible said, and of the children of Issachar, which were men, which had understanding of the times. I know you don't know why I'm using this verse, so you have to stay glued. Understanding of the times. To know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. This verse reveals that if you walk into the tribe of Issachar, not all the men have this understanding. If not, there will be no need for headship. Are you with me? Should I even share what I'm sharing? Lord, okay. When you begin to play, I will know. I'm using this verse because the children of Israel are a prophetic type of the body of Christ. It means that even though everyone who is saved, like I said in the morning, has the accurate ability to perceive the kingdom of God, the reason for headship in the body of Christ is because there is knowledge. There are knowledge gradients. There are things that we all know. There are things that some know. Are you with me? But those who know what the others do not know were given that knowledge so that they can lead those who don't know. But that's not the big thing. The big thing is that these boys had the understanding of times. And the reason for that gift is so that they can know what they ought to do. This is my burden. In interacting with the Holy Spirit, there is the foundational requirement to understand the seasons of his appearance so that you know exactly what the Holy Spirit comes to merchandise every time that you meet him. Remember, I started from the revelations of God. If God walks into your room tonight, what will you ask him? No, let's, let's just, can I come down? Yes, because your note is getting full. What will you ask him? It's not 10 minutes yet. Just start at 10 minutes. That's when he's told me that he will come. So, no, no, sit down, sir. What will you ask him? What would you have me do? Seriously. That, you have waited all your life for the coming of the great one to ask him what he will have you do. What if he was the one asking you now? What would you ask him? His presence. Okay. So, uh, we will log that. Because that, that's what you really want. Now, the reason why you gave me that first answer was because you understood timings. You were waiting for it like Israel in prophecy. But you didn't know when the Messiah came. Israel did not know the season of visitation. So, even though you wanted presence, it was me you thought was asking you. The question is, why did I choose you out of everybody? It could have been another person. So I don't know this prophetic thing of thus saith the Lord. I don't know that kind of thing. I just, I just, I just, it's a river that he stared. That's why it looks as if the way I'm preaching is not because I'm trying to align with that river. That's how Holy Ghost meetings are supposed to be. Somebody stares and whatever move has been unlocked, everybody journeys to it. So what you want is the presence. Okay, so in about 20 minutes, we'll get to the point where it can be given. Why we need to wait for 20 minutes is that his current appearance is not about the presence. What he's doing now, it's an impartation for the prophetic. And that's why he told me to start from here. That in the house, there are about four individuals who will come into the gift of the sons of Issachar. Three of them have been operating in a dimension of the prophetic such that they, they know things about people. But the advantage in the prophetic is not knowledge, it's understanding. 
Anybody can come to tell us that the sun will come out tomorrow. It's not an advantage. Those who bring an advantage are those who will tell us why the sun will rise tomorrow. Because that knowledge has no purpose until we know the why. So the prophetic is not just knowledge based, it's also understanding based. It's for that purpose that the New Testament prophetic movement not only reveals, it also expounds. Are you with me? But we'll get to the presence because it's part of the package. So what we'll do, because you have started playing, is that we'll pray for three minutes. And in case you have been trusting the Lord for an entrance into the strength of the prophetic, that's what the Holy Ghost came to do. He carries on himself the name of God's emphasis. So right now, he's manifesting as the prophetic spirit. Maybe I give you a verse of scripture. In John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus introducing the Holy Ghost to his disciples said, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. That's how he operates as the prophetic spirit. So I want to pray in tongues for three minutes. You can be on your seats. It, this coming is just for four individuals. And then I'll get back into the word. And Mentally, you are the spirit within, you are the king within. We ask that you be stared unto the knowings of that which is ahead. Be stared, be stared. Me atonoso akakeba bresovian teke bo ititado lebo koko tate ti ma popo teke brastonda ai popi se feleta me atombi se kubra rinto kave itonde kuate toma mi tole daisto me koke bresim to mi peya fiano ke bi akotaneta brastene kote ando. In the name of Jesus. Now, Father, amen. Now, Father, uh, so that we can continue the service, you have impressed upon my spirit that there is a giving in this hour. You will help me find these four individuals upon whom you are increasing the strength of the prophetic and you are also bringing that extra one person into this plane of expression you will just help me move to the congregation and your hand will be strong upon them and your hand will be strong upon them and your hand will be strong upon them let the four of them come under the strength Pastor, you will help me lay hands on them. They are four. They are four. They are four. So his hand still moves and he's touching. He's touching. He's touching. He's touching. He's touching. And he is releasing the ability to know the future. Oh, she brohono kotale. Bren si tom beri kariata haya. I brought teletovia comieto sine mento hasetoa mento kelisomai mento kake pebre scota. Let your hand come stronger upon them. Let it come stronger upon them. Let it come stronger upon them. That their feet become dipped into prophetic waters. They will operate by a knowledge that is not sourced. From any academic labor, nothing ever mental or routed from the realms of God. I but 
heavy no can come rest on tenny mento celai mento capre sumante mento capre polian sito ilo coparia sabio tenemo fa cabia tabai eyes that see ears that hear a heart that is rich in understanding Jesus so two individuals walked into this meeting both of you came with a list of the things that God had said to you and your current realities are that you are beginning to wane in faith now I began to sing that song because I sensed that the Holy Spirit was morphing from the spirit of prophecy and he was becoming the spirit of faith he was becoming the spirit of faith. I don't know where you are, but you begin to sense the stirrings of God all over you. From the crown of your head to the sole of your feet, there is a quickening unto believing, unto hoping against hope. Holy Spirit. So that, you can stop playing, amen. So that hands can be laid on these two individuals. Can you stare stronger in faith? Stare stronger. Stare stronger. Can you stare stronger? Can you stare stronger? That your voice becomes as rich as the way it was in the day that you first spoke to them. That the barriers that have been built unto fulfillment begin to crumble, begin to crumble, begin to crumble, begin to crumble. Begin to crumble. Holy Ghost! Touch! Touch! Touch, 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 touch. Everywhere. Help me find these two individuals and stare. Ooh. Play, my brother. Play, play. We're ministering together. That same song. And I will call upon your name. I know there are waves. But fix my eyes above the waves. Ha. And all sands arise. My soul will rest in your embrace As I am yours You were mine and you were mine <laughs> oh, oh, oh. 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 As it is written, we believed and therefore we have spoken. And we also have in the same spirit of faith. We believe, therefore we speak. It is done, say the Lord. It is done, say the Lord. The things that I said to you came from a, a region of fulfillment. And I bring you into it. To work in the places you called impossible. To see time begin to align with the fulfillment of the things that I said to you. For it shall no longer be delayed, say the Lord. I align men and time. To see, fulfill the things I said to you. Did I not promise this year? I will fulfill, saith the Lord. I will fulfill. Thank you, Father. 
in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. All right, let's join you a little bit more in the word. So give me Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. Okay, let's do John 16 first. Isaiah 44 is a positional. John 16 is also. John 16, 12. Let's start from there. Then we'll do Isaiah 44, 1 to 4. Oh. Oh. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Now, this is one of my most used portions of scripture in seeking to introduce the person of the Holy Ghost. Broadly speaking, broadly speaking, the full knowledge of the Holy Spirit in these times is not domiciled in a truth. The design is that you know him in the dimension of truth. Jesus was going to communicate to the Holy Spirit many things. However, when he reached out with a meter, it's a tool that the average teacher of doctrine does not use. Because as you bring the word of God to people, you must operate with a mother's mantle. And it's available in God. What the mother's mantle does is to help you take instantaneous vital signs, like you're in the hospital, of the audience to know how far they can travel with truth. Biblical teachings can constipate people. Are you with me? That they know too much than they can handle at a time. And then they become a people who are rich in head knowledge, but who have no life to testify of the things that they have learned. And so because we will have time, like daddy said in the morning, we'll be here for long. It's not a burden to teach one thing for one year. At least that's, that one thing is off the list. If it comes a burden to teach 10 things and people can't enter into any because you did not do a good job. So have we met before? No. There's this familiar thing. It's nothing prophetical. There's this familiar thing about you. What do you do? Sorry. What do you do? You know him very well. Okay, you don't even, this is the first time I'm meeting him. But it's like me, I've known him for 10 years. Okay. Um, I'll keep joining in my spirit. But it means that there's something that is there, that is here. There's a fellowship of the familiar. That's what I'm saying. Not a familiar spirit too. Uh -uh. You, mu you must be clear these days. But... What, what, what's your area of, core area of ministry? Sorry, sir. I'm putting you on the spot. I, I honor you from my heart. But what's your core area of ministry? Okay. So, if you know me, and you know my body for what he just said, you see why there's a connection. So, it means there's, there's, there's a labor that you're involved in that, that God has dipped my foot into. So, Walking in the same zone has created a familiar expression. Because merely you, I, I looked up and said, ah, he looks like somebody I've known all my life. Is, is that strong? And so I will take permission from pastor to ask for your name. And I'll just leave it at that for this season. Is it fine? Okay. Thank you, sir. What was that? So Jesus, I was talking about mother's man too. Many times we, we over teach in classes. Because the assignment of a minister is not to demonstrate that you know. The servant that the Lord will find, will reward, is the one that he are judged to be faithful. And the expression of the faithfulness of that servant will be that he gives meat to his household in seasons. So you must understand what the emphasis is for this season and just give what fits that season. Rice is food. 
but it's not, it's poison to a one year, a day old baby. Am I right? That's the expression of a mother's mantle. It was that mantle that Jesus deployed here and found out that there was a, um, the, the, the report of insufficient capacity. We have entered the water, so keep playing. Thank you, sir. There was a feedback of insufficient capacity in his hearers to be able to embody the things he was saying to them. And so that became the end of their class. What it meant was that the disciples progressively, if Jesus did not create a remedial system, it meant that every time you met them, even after Jesus' departure, all of them will manifest a gap in their existence. Because they could not stay through the curriculum in class. The average mechanical engineering graduate will not repair my car. I will still trust the roadside guy because I don't know what that one learned in school. May, may God help us. Uh, okay, don't believe me. But if your car is expensive, don't try it. They're supposed to be, you know, that's why doctors go for internship. They believe that classwork is not good enough. So learn on the job. The average mechanical engineering graduate does not learn anything on the job. When he goes for IT, he goes to do data analysis, make some money, and comes back and completes school. Is that not what's happening now? <laughs> so now this is what I'm saying. For every class that he stays out of, there's going to be a gap. So in the day, the emphasis is gear systems. If he stays out of class, he may be proficient in other areas, but if the problem is to deal with gears, we are going to know that he stayed out of class that day. That's the design. So, to say because they don't understand gear systems, we are not going to teach them gear systems, will mean that they will be insufficient in their labor. And if a product comes out of the car factory that is deficient in gear systems, it means that that man will grow hungry, not because he does not have a badge that licenses him to do that work, but that aspect was not taught. So what Jesus decided to do was to change the teaching mode and change the tutor of that class. There are yet many things. The curriculum is longer than I have taught you, but he cannot bear them now. And so in verse 13, he decides to introduce a new tutor. What you can do if you don't understand gear systems in drawing, because it's difficult to understand with drawing. What you do is to take them into a mechanical engineering lab and show it to them. They will remember better. Read out the formulas to them. Okay, engineering is a body. Seriously. Read out the formulas to them when they are looking at the gear systems. It's easier to match. Unfortunately, Jesus' is teaching ministry was not gifted that latitude in education. It was essentially verbal. So what he quickly did, because immediately he said, you cannot bear them now. People like Peter started pondering. It means there are things we'll not be able to do because we were not schooled in those activities. Jesus said to them, the remedy for your inability to bear and the insufficiency of education will be that I will introduce you to the next teacher. And the name of the next teacher will be called the Spirit of Truth. And that's where I'm going to. Remember I said to us that because of the need of the hour, the Holy Spirit must be known in the dimensions of full knowledge. So let's assume that it was the class of power that Jesus was teaching and saw that they could not bear it. Maybe they had gone through the class of purity. It means they will be pure, but they will be attacked permanently. So there are Christians who have no reason, I mean, no, no defect in purity, but are at the mercy of spirits all the time. Ultimately, the impact of those spirits begins to weigh in on their purity. 
Because they have no means to keep the enemy at bay. So the Holy Spirit was not introduced as the spirit of purity or the spirit of power. Because what Jesus was about was bringing them from partial knowledge unto full knowledge. In seasons before now, the Holy Spirit has been known with many emphases. But the last time I checked in the Spirit, I found out that what God is doing in the church now is that he's glorifying the church. And to pioneer that move of God, what he's doing is that um, he's sending the Holy Ghost as the spirit of glory. And it is only in that mode that the Holy Spirit can be known as the spirit of truth. Stay with me. When the spirit of truth is come, what it will do is that it will guide you into all truth. What was Jesus trying to teach them? That he could not teach them. Many things. It means foundationally there is, an, there is a relationship between the concept of things and truth. That's logic. If the problem is with many things, the Holy Spirit should be called what? The spirit of many things. But Jesus substituted for many things and gave them truth. It means the concept of truth that the Holy Spirit is known for is actually the concept of many things. So when it comes as the spirit of truth, he comes in his multifaceted fashion. And that's what we call glory. I remember in O-level physics, there's one experiment I used to detest. I didn't know I needed the glasses until, until last year. I went to preach in Portacourt. And I walked into my room and I saw the TV. It was... Uh, so I now told a brother who came with my host. He drove me in his car. And I said, sorry, what, what kind of TVs are they putting here? They now said there's nothing wrong with the TV. I said something is wrong. I said, every hotel I've walked into, the TVs all have the same problem. The pictures are blurred. He now said, well, I'm one of the heads of optometry in the teaching hospital. Can I bring my box? So he brought his box and slipped a lens into the holder and said, see, and I saw that the TV was clear. Oh, so, so it's my eyes that has a problem. That's why I wear my glasses. There's a possibility that the believer thinks that he can, he has a good grasp of everything until it happens upon a situation that he cannot manage and then he needs to go in search of the one who embodies all of it. Are you with me? The truth is, the Holy Spirit uses your disappointments as gates of invitation. You don't know what you need from him. You don't know what you need from him until you attempt to do something and you find out that you are unsuccessful. Do you think there's anything that you lack? When you walked in, you are my specimen. Sorry, sir. Do you think there's anything you lack now, now as you are sitting down here? I don't mean Atomo. Nothing. You don't, it doesn't look like you lack anything. Let me know you as an example. Those things always work. You step out in the morning, you're looking very good. Nice shoe. You don't know you lack anything until you get to the bus stop and your shoe opens. Then you will know that you needed gum. If someone had tried to sell gum to you, you would have said, waste of money. Are you with me? So, one of the things somebody who sells gum, organizers do it a lot. You find out within a range of 50 meters to 50 meters around the vulcanizer, there are nails everywhere. I used to pray, Lord, my tires like iron. That's what I pray when I'm passing through a vulcanizer. I don't, I don't want to be a victim. Because you won't go too far. You just hear, the man must eat. And we need to create a problem so that he can find relevance. That's what the Holy Ghost does. 
that's the only way he can practically bring you to the end of yourself and then you now ask him oh you are all of that please come and help me do this thing that's what jesus was doing to them have you been to church and the pastor is teaching and you're asking yourself why do we need this stuff that he's teaching because you think he's too advanced he's talking like he's in a seminary yes there's a way life matures that you find out ah, that thing pastor said that's the teaching ministry of the holy spirit he uses our disappointments he uses um the expression of our weaknesses as gates of invitation to get more of him the good thing as the spirit of truth is that he doesn't go back to god to bring the extra stops he travels with you so it's like a gunman in the bus stop, bus stop. You, you didn't need him when your shoe was not open but immediately your shoe opened you looked around and he was there it's better with the holy spirit because it doesn't come from there he just rises from within are you with me and presents the gum that glues your shoe the question is can you make him rise if it's all quiet and you feel lonely is, is there do you understand the protocol for his ascension because the Bible says that he that believeth upon me Jesus was quoting from Isaiah 55 as the scripture says, out of him shall flow forth rivers of living water. That tool that God uses to irrigate our lives no longer comes from heaven. The throne of the Holy Ghost is not there. If you look in Revelations, you find the throne of God and of the Lamb. But there are three in the Godhead. It means one of them moved. And he lives here. So it means the distance between you and your possibility is not there. The distance is here. To the situation but have you mastered how in a few minutes to let him come that's what pastor was doing he was pulling out songs from his spirit because those songs are like vehicles that's what ferries the holy spirit from within your human spirit and brings him into the situation and he comes alive it doesn't take time and you need to master running that way without time if not you have too many problems to solve around your life it must be instant so what we do is that mm, there's a Yoruba adage. One e, okay, you're Yoruba now. One e ati okere ni oloju jiji oti mekunsu. You don't speak Yoruba. Do you understand this adage? It means if your eye is deep like a well and you are going to a morning house, you need to initiate your tears from far. Because if you get to the morning house and everybody breaks out spontaneously crying, it will take a long time before tears is produced. You will be suspect. That, this one is not crying. Maybe it's the one that killed the person. So you must start on the road. So what we do is that we, we build our lives around systems that are engaging him continuously. I'll share, I'll share one with you. We went for my spiritual father's yearly conference last year, the International Eagles Conference. And on our way back, as we approached Abuja, you know, we were gisting. You must know how to gist and be, and be engaging him. We we're gisting. The driver was a captain in the army, one of our spiritual daughters. The husband, also a captain in the army, sitting in front. I was sitting at the back with my brother. That's the point man for RC and the battle. As we drove towards yeah, yeah. I spoke to the young lady driving us. She drives better than the husband. She drives military style. You know, military men can move very fast and stop immediately and move again. Very, very regulated driving. I said, Shil, um, you need to slow down. You need to slow down. I sense that something is about to go wrong. So she came from like 120, came to like 80, 60, and then boom. That was all we heard. Front bumper out. We saw a man go upstairs, land on our windshield, crash the whole thing, landed on his head. I heard the thought because it was on my side. Boom! And then blood everywhere. And the only sound I heard in my spirit was leave. And so I screamed it, leave! I had only a few seconds. By the time the head landed, the eyes had dilated and the, it was at the bus stop. 
So the crowd rushed and were beating on the car. Policemen came trying to arrest us. So I whispered to them, I said, there are captains in the army. Immediately the police disappeared. And then they returned after about five, six minutes. Carry him, carry him to the hospital. What we were carrying was a corpse. But immediately the man sat in the car. He opened his eyes and said, I'm sorry. With all that blood. You are sorry. For what? That he's the one that ran to the road. Okay. So I didn't even know they were recording his. Because when you get to the police station, you need the man's witness. If not, you stay there for long. Getting into police trouble is like witchcraft. You, even when you are free, you are not free. Somebody will still come in and say, let him come back on Monday. Now, the real supernatural part of it was not that he woke up from the dead. Because it was a space of about 8-10 minutes. It was that when, we got, when I went out to get something on their behalf, because police told them to stand there, let's... They were just cleaning him up. The doctor looked at me and said, I've seen your face before. I said, no, you have not. I don't live in Abuja. He said, I've seen you on YouTube. I said, yes. He said, no wonder. The wonder was that that man didn't have one broken bone. The only thing they sutured was a little part of the back of his head. Now, the question is, where did the blood come from? How does a man go up in the air, break the windshield, nothing on his body, no, no ribs broken, no leg broken, and it was his leg that we hit that removed our bumper. Then landed on his head, got to the hospital, and the guy, is the guy went home that day. Then I understood how to live like the proverbial boy scout, that you must be alive. So that instantaneously there's something you can draw. Paul was teaching. So the Holy Spirit must have been ministering to him as the spirit of wisdom and revelation. But in the middle of his teaching class, a guy hangs on the window. And according to scriptures, the young man doses off and falls outside. It's the destiny of people who hang, who hang. I mean in the kingdom too. They are one leg in, one leg out. Many times they will fall outside. Now Paul goes down and wakes him up. The question is, how did he transit reality? From the spirit of wisdom and revelation into what Jesus introduced at the tomb of Lazarus as resurrection and life. The average believer will go into his room and said, we need to pray for three days. By three days, they will have buried somebody who was appointed unto life, but there was no one to help him. What God is giving is a rounded experience. He's coming as the spirit of all things. And that's the concept of the spirit of glory. I'll take you briefly into a, 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 a physics class now. Our spiritual father was telling us a story. Was it him? I think it was him. About a young lady who was sent to ruin a family small girl about age seven she came into that family as a maid and then wealth collapsed wealth collapsed it was a pastor's house and after a while they told her in the cover make him sick and so in trying to make the pastor sick she killed the pastor you know the apprentices in witchcraft too that's how it works so she killed the pastor they now the story now said that they now called the girl in the coven. We didn't tell you to kill him. We told you to make him sick. Oh yeah, take, go and raise him up. I thought it was only on our side that we could raise up, but those possibilities are there too. Now, before she came, the pastor's wife had gathered other pastors and they began to pray. That was the problem. They were praying over this man and their prayers had generated a covering. A covering that did not carry the essence, the life-giving essence, but could preserve from the entrance of witchcraft. <laughs> so, this girl was coming back to raise the dead person because she had potential to raise, but the cloud did not give her access. And so the pastor died and was buried. If we do not labor, 
for the full knowledge of the spirit will create things like that because the simple thing they should have done is that the pastor should stop praying let the witch raise the <laughs> yes now let the uh... God is doing what he's doing because his witness across territories has suffered I was in Mina and then the pastor was telling me about another church down the road that was serially robbed. And that they had prayed that in that church people get saved. It means the life-giving essence of Jesus is in the church. They know the Holy Spirit as the spirit of life. In that place, people get transformed. They know him as the spirit of transformation. But what they have cannot stop robbers from stealing speakers and stealing those things. So after they have prayed for long, the, like the church pastor himself now told the elders, see, 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 we, are, we have labored too much. There's a man down the road in the north, what they call a babalao is boka. Now the boka down the road can solve this problem. Now, this, the pastor told me that one of the elders stood and said, no, no, how would he say, ah, are you sure the man can solve? Say, 100%, that man can catch a thief. Well, the boka was invited. The church has three pillars in front, and the man did something on the pillars. When they woke up the following morning, the thieves were glued to the pillars. It's as though some realities were seconded to the boka. We can save, but the boka can preserve. The gap is that the Holy Spirit is known in the context of a singular reality. He's the spirit of transformation. He's the spirit of our salvation. But he's not the spirit of our preservation. And that's a gap in knowledge. That has given the enemy the, the access to, to express. So if you are in this meeting tonight, you may want to take stock at your life. Because if somebody came and said, you need to know him more. You are asking yourself, I know enough. He may be the spirit of prayer. And so when you pray, we think that you don't have needs. But your life is a testament that your prayer has not occasioned the supply of all that you need. So Jesus was not going to take chances like he will not take tonight. What he administers is the spirit of truth. And the assignment of the spirit of truth is to guide into all truth. So what is the truth of God? In John chapter 1 verse 14, John was gifted the privilege to extra Jesus. You will find out that if you are a good student of scriptures, the gospel of John was written separate from the other gospels. There was actually a reality of the Christ that John was willing to mask. And that was Jesus' humanity. So he said nothing about the birth of Jesus. He said nothing about Jesus' um, ancestry. There was no genealogy written in the book of John because his assignment was to market Jesus as the divine man. Jesus as life. So twice in John chapter 1, we see John go into a laboratory and return with a feedback of his research on who the Christ was. He begins by calling him not a man but a word. And he tells us that if we hack into you, what will come out is blood. If you cut into the Christ, what you will find there is life. And that, that life in transmission, like I said in the morning, becomes what? The light of men. And that that light has been back tested in the laboratory against every weight of darkness. And that, that darkness cannot understand it. So it can overcome it. In verse 14, he carries out another experiment. The word became flesh, and it dwelt amongst us, and we beheld, that was the feedback of the research, his glory. The word glory there can be substituted with the English word advertisement. That if there were two men who lived on the streets of Jesus, there was something that the life of Jesus was giving off, that the life of the other man, no matter how pious he was, was not giving off. Because his glory was not as of the glory of a son of Abraham. It was the glory as of the only begotten. 
the true proof of paternity is an aligned DNA. So what John was saying was that if you cut into God and you cut into the Christ, you will find out that everything that is domiciled or by possibilities and existence in God is replicated in the Christ. That's why he called him the only begotten. So that the constituents could be given a natural reference, he categorized the things that he saw in the Christ in two categories. He said it was full of grace and truth. So what is grace? Grace comes to us tonight as a coin. That's the cheapest way to define it. It has an upside and it has a downside. Now the upside of grace, which is ahead of the coin, is saving grace. That's what we refer to as God's unmerited favor. That's what Titus told us has appeared unto all men. And that when it comes, it has a teaching ministry. Am I right? Good. But you understand that from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, there is another shape of grace that was advertised, which is not teaching and which is not saving. That grace is enabling. We therefore, having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us have grace. And the purpose of that grace is that by it we may serve God acceptably. It means this dimension of grace is work related, not status related. So what we call this is enabling grace or the supernatural abilities of the Christ. You know we use that word like that in English. You see a man who comes and does things beautifully, you say, Kai, this guy is, is graced. So there's that dimension of grace that is work related. So grace has two sides. In the same way, truth has two sides. The first side of truth has to do with principles. So you find out that the teaching ministry of Jesus was largely expressive along the lines of the principles of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is likened unto, is likened unto, is likened unto. What he was trying to do was that by principles, people can become acquainted with the dynamics of the kingdom of God. But there's a second side to grace. And that's how the Holy Spirit also comes. It's called reality. Experience. So if you take that word experience and put it back in the original verse, what Jesus was saying to them is that what you can learn in a theory class, there is a spirit that is licensed to produce experiences. You can't bear mentally what I'm saying to you. So when the spirit of your assigned experiences is come, he will guide you into all experiences. There's an experience called power. I saw a WhatsApp video many years ago, about three, four years ago, of a young lady who was talking with a philosopher, a Roman setting, on the subject of power. So the, 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 the philosopher said, you know, power is, I was trying to define it, and the lady being a princess looked at the guards and said, arrest him. And then they rushed and arrest him. Kill him. They drew their swords. Drop your swords, step back, and they stood back. She said, that's power. It, power is power. There's no definition for, for power. It's, it's just power. Are you with me? It's just power. If something stands against the move of God, we don't explain it away. You just introduce power. Once you introduce power, there's compliance, and then you move on. That's what power is. Is somebody with me? So power finds its true definition in an experience, not in speech. So what the Holy Spirit does is that he guides you into the experience of power. Some people think that it's difficult to be holy. It's difficult to be righteous. It's because you got saved, you were given a gift, but you thought that that gift was self-operating. You did not know that the gifts of God are designed to find government in the person of the Holy Spirit. If you check my list of the names of the Holy Spirit, it's endless. Because what I have done is to build him, as, or build on him as the administrator of every possible reality in God. So that if the need is for governance, it becomes the spirit of government. If, it's the, if the need is for fasting, it's by the Holy Ghost that I fast. 
my longest fast was 15 years and 8 days. And it was by the Holy Ghost. I, I just had a natural detest, distaste for food. It may come in very nice colors and very nice aromas. I had an unnatural will to walk away. Even now, I'm still struggling to eat. So a young, young man met me in one of the meetings. I said, eh, you mean it's possible to fast like that? I said, yes, sir. So the young guy started fasting until his mom called me. She and and I'm I've not even met the young man before. I mean, we didn't have too long talk. We met in a meeting, got home, called, and I said, I, I didn't lie to you. That was how long before I broke. We break around 7, 8 in the evening, but it continued like that. Maybe it's why I have a small body, but it's good. Um, so it's the spirit of my fasting. So if there's short fast or there's personal fast, I don't lean on my ability to walk away from food. That reality is administered by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, there's 40 day fast. Help me, help me, help me. That's how I wake up in the morning. I say help me more than any other thing. And then help me is an invitation to this spirit to activate that aspect of him in you. And then you keep moving on. If I get into the middle of the day and until fasting is real, you will not know the power of the saint of, of popcorn. The ones that don't count, Satan doesn't disturb you. The ones that will change your life, I mean ordinary granite, you'll, be, you'll, be like, you'll become like a bloodhound, sniffing, where are they producing this thing? So that you can break the fast. If I find out that that invasion is being orchestrated in the enemy, what solves it is another help me. And then he administers the grace, supernatural ability for fasting so that that spiritual experience can be sustained. Is somebody with me? People say, okay, we, we just sang one line of a song and then you come and say, stop. God is saying, how do you hear that much? Hearing is a spiritual experience. But that experience was not designed to be forced by a man. It was designed to operate under the administration of the spirit of our experiences. So, I found out that spirits are strong when you acknowledge who they are. The realm of darkness has replicated the realm of light. Unfortunately, we don't have too many movies that show our operations. So a Yoruba film, he says, you can't, we school you. If you want to bring some go into a building, you can't be creative. He only has a particular setting. He has particular colors. Make sure you recreate his original shrine. Make sure it comes in the original color. And then keep calling his name. If I say, can we continue saying Jesus? After about the 20th time, you will get tired. The Shango man knows that if he stays true to calling Shango, a spirit will appear. Is somebody with me? So, immediately I learned that lesson. I come into a meeting. And I say, oh, you have the spirit of revelation. And a gate opens in heaven. And then I begin to run. I begin to run like that. Somebody is saying, maybe he didn't even prepare for this session. Let me show you my notes. Let me show you my notes so that you know that I do due diligence, but there's a way here. Okay, so this is my notes for this evening. So I write very extensively so that if I give somebody, the person can preach the note by mere reading it. So when it comes to spirit of revelation, every experience of the believer is locked into a dimension of the Holy Ghost. And until you know him in that dimension, that dimension will be a gate of weakness. Are you with me? How does the spirit of truth become the spirit of glory? Because that's what God told me he wants to do tonight. He will send me a song of the spirit. It's a normal song. I mean a song that they are singing in heaven now. Once that song comes, the reality of heaven will come. How many people have gone through the physics experiment called light? 
Okay, many people went to art class. Okay. Does it rain in Lagos? Oh, yeah, no. Okay, so it rains here. Sometimes when the rain becomes dark and our hearts begin to go back because of the wickedness in the land to the days of, um, of Noah, there is the talking of a covenant that God flashes in the skies. It's called what? A rainbow. Well, physics explains to us that the rainbow happens as a natural phenomenon. That um, the ray of the sun hits the rain clouds at a particular degree. I think it's 45 degrees. And then what it does, like it does in your physics lab, is that the cloud begins to function like a rectangular prism. So once the light hits it, it splits the light into its spectrum. And so you see all the seven, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Good. So that's what produces the rainbow. But we know, according to scriptures, that was a token that God left. And because of the sweet-smelling sacrifice of Noah, he was willing to lose out on one of his options of wiping out the world, no longer by water. He has fire, he has other things, but water, out. Now, white light embodies all those seven colors. That's what physics tells us. So in trying to understand the Holy Spirit as the spirit of all things, he operates as a white light. However, there are seasons when there is a multifaceted expression of needs in the earth. To operate as white light will not be sufficient. So the multifaceted set of needs give him the privilege of splitting himself into all of that. Is somebody understanding me? What I'm trying to do is look for a spiritual thing and domesticate inside a physics class. I'm saying that the rainbow is one white light from the sun. It's the density of the rain cloud that splits the light and then gives us that bow in the air. The Holy Spirit can come as red. Let's assume red is power. Let's say orange is purity. What other Christian experience do we have? Let's say yellow is wisdom. And it can be known as those individual names. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of power, the spirit of grace, that's supernatural ability, the spirit of love, the spirit of hope, the spirit of faith. But you see, there are seasons where the divine emphasis is designed to capture a multifaceted set of needs in that day, God does not deploy his spirit in individual strains. He draws all of the strains of the possibilities of the Holy Spirit into one essence and releases them at once. That's what we call glory. It's the congregated advertisements of all of the humanly perceivable dimensions of God. That's glory. So if God can be perceived along a million lines... When glory comes into the house, it means God will be functioning in a million ways. So that everybody's unique challenge is sorted without saying now is power, now is grace, now is love, now is truth. He becomes the spirit of all things as the spirit of glory. The church has showed up in our days beautiful but void of expression in certain aspects. And what God is doing to remedy the reputation of the church, which is by extension his reputation, is to deploy his spirit as the spirit of all things, the spirit of glory. This is the Holy Ghost night. I perceived as I laid down in my Lord, and thank you for the lodging, it's very comfortable. I think I should be coming to Lagos and be hiding my head there. One, that area is quiet, and there are no strange people around. The average, the average lodging you need to you need to ascend to sleep. <laughs> May God give you understanding. I've stayed in hotels that from the door you are already a smoker, even you. Sometimes 
when you are high, you are wondering if you are high on the Holy Ghost or you are high on weed. Because, <laughs> but, but, oh, no, 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 no. I, what did I say to you, sir? I said that I'll come my wife. I also told you, I said, in a long time, you see, the peace with which I slept, it was just like two hours. Ah, Jesus. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If it is good, I always acknowledge it. In case you're an itinerant minister, you understand that it's not always good. Oh. Hmm. Uh, may God give you understanding. It's not, it's, it's not always, sometimes it's very bad. Uh, there are times I, they lodge me and when they come to pick me, they can't find me. Because I have relocated to, <laughs> to another place. So it might be two streets away to say, okay, uh, I'm no longer there. I've gone to. And, mm, because Jesus said when you come into a place, whatever they give you is what you should take. So we, you can't complain to say this place is bad. But in, let them know in their mind that this is not it. Thank you for the good place. So I'm saying to us, that because the witness of God has suffered, not because God is no longer strong, but because of our inability to capture certain dimensions of God, the world now sees us as a vulnerable company. And God's remedial protocol is to give us, again, interactions with the fullness of His Spirit as a spirit of glory. So that every man's deficit is accounted for in the release of the glory. Because I don't know what deficit you have noticed in your life. We would not have needed a Holy Ghost meeting if God had not carried out an appraisal, um, an appraisal exercise below our consciousness. That he walked into the room and checked to find out, I know you are sufficient in that, but are you also sufficient in this? When it comes like that, he doesn't tell us. And one of the things that that appraisal report must have revealed to him is that our needs are not, are not common. Every man has a different strain of manifestation of infirmity. And so because we don't have too many services, what it does is that it gives us the spirit of glory so that every man who interacts with him will find a solution to his own deficit. And that's who the Holy Spirit is now. That's the move that is pioneering a day of glory. The curtains are being drawn on the earth. That's why everything is collapsing. What we used to know as knowledge will no longer be sufficient. And the truth is, the degradation that is coming to our world cannot be matched with our intelligence. It will always be ahead of human intelligence. If you are in school now, school is a lie. Oh. Mm. Because the things you are teaching now can no longer pass. That's true. Because if your lecturer comes with, with, with a biology textbook that, is, uh, that, that, that was written in the 1940s, how to solve the COVID-19 is not there. Are you with me? Cancers were not, this, were, were not this, this, this expressive. There are many things that have crept up that are not there. Even if you are studying online, what they are teaching you has to do with a problem they are already solving or something they are speculative of. You need to be a son of Issachar to know what is far ahead. That's where the church is. I love this season. I shared with them last week Sunday. I said it's getting, or maybe Tuesday, I said it's getting that kind of world. As I went to preach in the Lauren, and I walked into a restaurant to buy food. And I saw all kinds of rice. And, well, because I don't eat too white, and I don't eat too much, I know green rice, I know the one that Nigeria and Ghana fights on. I know that one. I, I know white rice. And there are these tiny ones, um, no, or father. No, sorry, that's the small one. The tiny one is the basmati. Now, but the basmati came in a brown shade. So I felt okay. Curiosity, let's 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 eat this one. And you know, it's it's, de it's well, it's the most decorated most times in the bowl. So I said I want this one, and the young man took a spoon of rice, put it in a plate, and said, What else do you want? So I said, Who eats one spoon of rice? God bless you, sir. Who eats one spoon of rice? He says, sir, it's expensive. Okay. So you, you have a meter to measure how much people can pay. 
Okay, because I walked in casually, I can't eat. The, how much is the spoon? He said, it's, sir, it's expensive. It's 1,600. So my next question was, are you a Christian? He said, no. I said, okay. So let me school you. So I took him to Isaiah chapter 60. To show him that what is coming upon the earth is not as terrible as what will come upon people. Because it is darkness that will cover the earth. The earth is more fortunate. It is gross darkness that will cover the people. But that, that season is only one side, that annunciation is only one side of a coin. We were waiting for these dark days when the strength of man will, will die. And then suddenly in the midst of the darkness, God will begin to rise upon the people. So I told him, in the kingdom where I belong to, until there's scarcity in that kingdom, there's no scarcity here. Okay? Serve me rice. Th that's your job. It's not, to, it's not to help people measure. Last, last, if I can't pay, I'll join your workforce. May God give you understanding. But that day will not come. If I'm on his errand, he pays my bills. That's, that's, the, that's the agreement. He pays my bills. So it's the day of the church. And what God is causing to rise upon his people is glory. But you see, that glory does not find fullest expression in radiance. What he's doing is that he's advertising. And if you're advertising, you come in all your bright colors. So that's what God is doing. Where every one of us becomes a specimen of the possibilities of God as captured in his spirit. That is the same man who demonstrates wisdom, who demonstrates power. When you look at the same man, it's all of grace. That same man is also all of faith. And you think that because it's potent, it will impact upon his purity. When you check, you find out that it's still pure. Each of us, an advertisement of all of the colors of God. By the same self spirit called the spirit of glory, the spirit of all things. That's the one that God told me to introduce us to. He said, when you get there, talk to them. Tell them that it's a season of glory for the church. And so I am releasing my spirit as the spirit of glory. How do we engage him? Isaiah chapter 44. And then we begin to rise. Oh, Siprika Hata. Hear ye now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Let's go on. Thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Next verse. For I will pour water upon him... That is thirsty. So we are in another season of the outpouring. And if you have studied scriptures, you find out that the Holy Spirit is captured in operation or in, in appearance within the context of certain metaphors. So he's called the fire, right? In the context of water, it's called the rain. Sometimes it's called the flood. The Holy Spirit is also called the wind. And all of those metaphors has to give us an accurate picture of how he operates when he comes into a place. Now, what God is saying is that in this season, which I believe is this season, there will be a pouring. And what he will pour is water upon him that is thirsty. It means the one who wants to receive from him must find his way into the reality that is advertised. The man who comes to him must show up thirsty. That's why pastor was saying your expectations. I stopped praying that I push your name the expectations because I found out that our minds don't travel very far. When you come before the Lord of glory you cannot fully articulate what you will come with. So in two minutes, my beloved brother, who is my co-preacher tonight, went from, what was his first request? From what do you have me do? You would think that it was Paul. <laughs> Nas Acts chapter 9. What will you have me do? And he ran back to 
to Exodus 33. Your presence. So he transited from Paul to Moses in less than <laughs> if you've gone to a buffet kind of dinner you can't decide from home what you eat it's when you arrive Abby. so when I get there the fish I eat it will be hake and um, the rice will be your father when you get to the table you see more decorated expressions of rice Say, I'll eat your father tomorrow. Let me eat these ones. The last time I went to Makodi, my spiritual father's wife invited us to have lunch in their house. We didn't know what we were going to meet, so we got there. And people ate, you were people ate pounded, I'm same person. And saw so how beautiful the rice was. And said, ah, let, let me. It was the first day I saw people eating pounded and my rice on the same in the same meal. Say ah ah. Say, it's your love rice you are eating. Say, let me take a little of that vegetable and a little of this thing. Some people took rice and still took obono. Say, and I was wondering what is this? It's because you really cannot name what you want. Sometimes you don't know what you need until God becomes expressive. And then you find out, I need that too. And I need that too. I need that too. Glory has God. Wonderful God, miracle worker, King of Kings, omnipotent God, I worship you, your majesty is forever. is designed to be routed by another agency. That's what we call the presence of God. I, I stopped because I sensed that God wanted to advertise what I was saying. Then I will go and close and then we go full blast. Um, so I said that the glory of God is stewarded by another agency in God which is called the presence of God. You see, the presence of God is, um, is spiritual and can only be known spiritually. So that it's possible for a man to say, God is with me and he's the only one who has the signs. But you see, when the presence begins to administer the glory, even a non-believer will know that God came because the glory is the congregation of of all of the humanly perceivable dimensions of God. That's what he does with glory. That's even if you don't believe me, I'll flash something at you that will make you acknowledge that I am here. That's what God wants to do even for national recovery. Tomorrow evening we are praying for the, for the nation of the show, and the Lord wants me to speak on the subject, the bringer angel. That there's an angel that stewards that dimension. Brings the glory. Just ask, ask me to activate. And even those who are the enemies of God, we acknowledge that is here. Many times the glory is fleeting. But those who route it continuously are those who have mastered how to curate the presence. Because the possibilities of knowing the glory are, are constant for those who already have found a way of housing the presence. Right now, so that we can continue, God wants to give four garments. Four? Okay, that's the fifth one. The garments are with us, and what he wants to do is to impact with his presence. 
you will know it every time you give god have a chance to be strong you engage him you pray you peep into the word you pick up a spiritual song these five individuals will begin to experience that garment in greater dimension it will be like someone literally took a clock and wore it upon you and in the next two minutes all the five of them will begin to experience it you can stop playing let me ask him lord these garments that you have sent to us to establish your presence with these precious ones i ask that you will help me find them and you will wear them that by the anointing from the crown of the head to the sole of the feet they will be dressed in your presence they will be dressed in your presence you will start from this left side and you'll flow to the right side from the left side to the right side from the left side to the right side there are three here and there are two there so lord show me these individuals show me these individuals that as i begin to count from one to seven these garments will be worn it's a gift of the presence of god it's a gift of the presence of god you can play now you can play now you can play now you can play now he will ride upon the strength of that sound he will ride he will ride he will ride you will literally feel something being worn from your head down oh so begin to wear them precious spirit one two holy ghost three yes four five six now seven so let it become tangible let it become tangible from the crown of the head to the sole of the feet cause them to be draped in your presence <laughs> oh, that from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet there is a knowing that you are near Yes, you heard my God. You heard my God. I worship you. Yes, you heard my God. You heard my God. I worship you. Oh, yes, you are my God. You are my God. I worship you. Yes, you are my God. You are my God, I worship you. Yes, you are my God, you are my God, I 
worship you. Yes, you work my God. You work my God. I worship you. Just the keyboard. Yes, you work my God. You work my God. I worship you. Yes, you were my God. You were my God. I worship you. He clocks with his presence. Keep playing, keep playing. It was you that picked the sound from heaven. My, my assignment was just to find out what the sound was saying. Already know you ever know she sell a hardy as her time and leave a honey on a CSIA. Rest of me, no, ma. Neco Kivina, no, Santa Deliene, Neco Cometa Sadai. Memory no delay, so baby, priest of the Lord, yet I had Yes, you work, my God. You work, my God. I worship you. The presence of God. The presence of God. That garment that stewards the realities of God. I give unto you the gift of my presence. That's what I hear him say. You will wear it tangibly. And of that presence, there will be an effulgence of my glory. Yes. The multifaceted advertisements of my presence, yet the Lord. That they that seek to define will have too much to see. For I deploy to recover my weakness. I deploy for testimonies. For in the similitude of the shouts of the living creatures, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Your life shall be an experience of shifting reality. Presolia fico, presolia kifo, and of the arde, conte feratia sata, combre simo, e pelite se sate, involictonicae, bebrex comi porato. For every strain of the signatures of the enemy on your life, I will take away and replace with an advertisement of myself. For he shall be called a man of purity. And in the seasons of their approach to view his purity, he will be known by another name. For him that is pure shall be powerful, and him that is powerful shall be consecrated. The consecrated shall also come the engraced. Oh, the engraced shall also be called the wise. For in this season, I come with a multifaceted expression of myself. I come with a multifaceted expression of myself. I come to redeem my lost witness. And I am sending you to be the vessel of glory in this season. For the interactions with my spirit will no longer be to no end, saith the Lord. Every time you meet him in a shape, you will embody that which you have encountered. To the end that your encounters will no longer be fully captured in storytelling. There will be experiences. Oh, Hosanna. Oh, 
Osana, Osana, Summer David. He comes, he comes. Hello, Osana, Osana. We wait on him. Osana, Summer David. Oh, Mama femi mo sata be mo berate te tu aten of the adam ya to ne ko ke pa presidenti osana osana Upon him that is thirsty, what upon him that is thirsty? Is there anyone in the house today who came thirsty? It's a good time to make that confession before him. I pour water, I pour water, I pour water. The waters are available, but the ones that we receive in fullness of him are those who acknowledge that they are thirsty. We come to confess our vulnerability that we have become so much but there is still so much to enter into. I didn't come full. I came with idiosyncratic test. This is me. This is me. This is me. Et no sit up a period summing off. I put glad to carry your say to what the paperboard. I came thirsty. I came thirsty. I came thirsty. I came thirsty. I am needy. There are areas of vulnerability. I am known to be strong, but I acknowledge that there are areas of weaknesses. They are gates that give the enemy an opportunity to buffet my body. Woo! Come for me. Come, come for me. Come for me. Come for me. That I will receive the pourings of the waters. The pourings of the water. The pourings of the water. The pourings of the water. Oh, patakoko. I copa papa rataka sit up a yate a copila bocoto mesobicate I bope copri soleto by a belly capia bato mato crevetone impetu sato pipale a commento bianda caparia sobretonai I copra diate bopeli fenoketai I kitate sonne coprasa I can test. I came test. I came test. I came test to pour your waters. For I pour water upon him that is thirsty. Oh. 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 Hey, no more cover. Hapa, 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 hapa. The cat up about E kwa bonto kon le bise superodia. Me ki ba ki embos. Bresi ka ba bito mumbai. Fie to sute en afre heno to hai. Yala na ba 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 bohosa. Sete ne bohate ya. Now, what is giving us are still sprinkles, are still sprinkles. But, but, but the journey has begun. The journey has begun. Still sprinkles, but the journey has begun. So only a few can testify to receptions from him. But, but it's about to become a flood. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. And floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring, and they shall spring up as among the grass. 
as the willows by the water courses. It's a night of irrigation. The dryness around will no longer impact on the shape of your existence. He comes as a flood. Last song. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Play, play. Okay, maybe you didn't hear my song. Hallelujah, Hosanna. Hosanna. 